Remember when you were a kid and you were first learning how to ride a bike? If you were like me, you probably had training wheels on that bike. If 3D printers are like bikes, then this Trudon 2.0 is like a Voron with training wheels. I've talked a lot about this printer before, so if it's the first you're hearing about it, make sure you go back and check out the other videos in this series. Today we're taking it back to basics as I unbox and assemble my second Trudon 2.0. Sorry for the printer noise in those opening shots. Sometimes I do use my printers and not just talk about them. We're back with another installment in the Trudon series, part eight to be precise. So you find yourself wanting a large printer that's fast, easy to assemble and available at an affordable price. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, the Trudon 2.0 is here to prove you wrong. This is a great option for those looking for a turnkey solution for large format printing, or those that want to develop their 3D printing expertise without biting off more than they can chew. The first time I assembled this printer, it took me just over three hours. I had ambitions of beating that this time, but those quickly evaporated. This time around, I decided to follow the revised assembly instructions provided by Team Gloomy. These are more thorough and include some extra steps to ensure proper functionality and long-term reliability. Before beginning assembly, I took the bottom panel off and inspected the internals, making sure no connections came loose during transit. We'll start by installing the Z-axis extrusions into the base of the printer. First, backing off the pre-installed screws. You may wish to install Loctite here, but I opted to skip this as I don't expect these to come loose. Make sure the linear rails face into the build volume. Next, we'll install the top frame. Orientation matters here too. Make sure the light bar is at the back of the printer. Then it's on to the leveling feet. We'll thread these on all the way for now and adjust as necessary according to the surface the printer will ultimately be sitting on. Now we need to install the Z-axis idler pulleys. These can be loosely installed for now. We'll tighten them down later as we're tensioning the belts. Okay, now we're going to diverge from the instructions for a minute. There are some issues with the print head from factory that will require us to do some disassembly. Before I show you that, let me tell you about the sponsor for today's video. PCBWay. PCBWay is your preferred partner in prototyping. They provide a wide variety of services to help turn your ideas into reality, ranging from 3D printing to injection molding and sheet metal forming to CNC machining. As their name implies, they also manufacture printed circuit boards, or PCBs. Simply upload your design to their easy to use quote generator to get instant pricing. Whether you're designing a new product or simply working on a personal project, PCBWay can help bring your ideas to life. Now, where were we? We'll begin by removing the print head cover, which is secured by four screws. We'll also remove the extruder PCB cover and the brass standoffs. The only things left holding the extruder on are two screws on the rear. These are hidden behind the cable chain, so you'll need to push that up and out of the way in order to access them. Finally, unplug the extruder motor cable. Then the extruder can be lifted off. The objective here is to replace the stock rubber sealed bearings with some metal sealed alternatives. There have been reports of the stock bearings degrading over time, leading to extrusion issues and other frustrations. You don't technically need to remove the extruder in order to do this. This can be done in situ on the machine, but I wanted to show you the complete process for removing the extruder in case you need to do so in the future. I'll put a link to these bearings and any other supplies you'll need in the description of this video. Both the front and rear bearings will need to be replaced. While we have the extruder apart, we'll take this opportunity to add Loctite to the grub screw on the drive gear shaft, as well as the motor shaft. Vividino advertises the Trudon as having a quick change hot end assembly, but unfortunately they have torqued these two screws down too tight from factory, rendering this functionality inoperable. These are intended to be for alignment only and don't need to be tight. So we'll back them off a little while we have this apart. We'll then reverse the disassembly steps to reassemble the print head. If you lose track of which screws go where, refer to the Voron afterburner documentation. All right, after that quick detour, we're back on track and following the assembly guide. The next step is to insert the gantry into the frame of the printer and thread the pre-installed belts through the gantry and up over the Z-axis idler pulleys. In the back right corner, ensure that the cable goes behind the belt and not in front of it. We then make a loop with the belt and hook it onto the gantry. You may need to back off the idler pulley screws if the belts won't reach. Now we'll attach the gantry to the bearing blocks on the linear rail carriages. 
repeat times four, and then we'll start plugging the cables from the drag chain into the breakout board on the base of the printer. The back panel of the printer will get the foam tape treatment, which will help with insulation and noise dampening. In my first Trudon build, I missed the fact that there are two distinct thicknesses of foam tape supplied with the printer. So make sure you grab the one millimeter stuff for this task. Next, we'll add some dual-sided tape to the air filtration unit. Make sure you peel the red part off to expose the adhesive before installing the filter on the panel. To attach the panel to the frame, we first need to insert some T-nuts into the extrusions. The easiest way I've found to do this is using an Allen key. Position the T-nuts such that they roughly correspond to the holes on the panel. You will likely need to make minor adjustments in order to get everything lined up. If the T-nuts are getting stuck, try backing off the linear rail screws on the opposite side of the extrusion. Next, we'll do some cable management. Install a few cable clips and encase the cables in a textile sleeve. The PTFE tube needs to be cut to length and then inserted into the holder on the rear of the printer. The spool holder mounts on the back and the filament sensor just kind of dangles there. Then comes the most tedious and time consuming part of the build, the installation of the acrylic panels. If you don't care to enclose your printer, you can skip these steps and save a ton of time. We'll start by removing the protective film and then install the hinges on the door panels. Pay attention to orientation here and ensure the hinges are installed in the correct positions. Next, insert T-nuts into the extrusions to coincide with the position of the hinges on the doors. These hinge spacers have a protective film too, so we'll remove that before mounting the doors. The mounting procedure is the same as for the back panel. Slight adjustments to the T-nut positions may be required to get the doors installed. Then it's on to the side panels. There are some black acrylic spacers that need to be installed between the panels and the frame. I found it easiest to do one side first, then the other, leaving the top for last. Leave things loose at first so you have some wiggle room to adjust the T-nut positions as required. We'll repeat the procedure for the opposite side. The instructions don't specifically indicate that we should add foam tape to the top panel, but we have extra so we might as well. I'm using the 3mm tape here and applying it directly to the frame. You could also apply it on the panel side if you prefer. The LCD can then be plugged in and screwed on. The screw on the side can be used to adjust the angle. Next, we'll install the Z end stop pin and snap in the corner pieces. We're getting close now. If you haven't already, make sure to loosen the spring-loaded thumb screws on each of the bearing blocks. The XY belts come tight from factory, so we'll want to reduce the belt tension to minimize the strain on the motors. We first need to position the gantry such that the fixed side of the belt path is 150 millimeters long. We'll then pluck the belt and use a sound spectrum analyzer app to visualize the frequency response. The tension can be adjusted by turning the nuts on the pulley blocks. The Voron recommended guideline is a tension of 110 Hertz. The factory setting is around 190 Hertz. I was only able to get the frequency down to around 150 Hertz before the pulleys ran out of travel, so that will have to be good enough. We'll then repeat the procedure for the Z belts moving the gantry to a position at which the fixed side of the belt measures 150 millimeters. When I tried strumming the fixed side, the note was very flat and hard to detect with the app. So instead, I decided to pluck the long side. I tuned each belt to the recommended frequency of 140 hertz and listened to make sure they were all making a similar note. The rails don't come pre-lubricated from factory, so you want to apply some of the supplied grease to the rail carriages. This is more easily done before the panels are installed. But if you ever want to re-lubricate, you'll need to learn to do it with the panels on. For this procedure, I'll be using some hypodermic needles I ordered from Amazon. We'll use an 18 gauge needle for the MGN12 rail on the X axis and a 20 gauge needle for the MGN9 rails on the Y and Z axes. The tip of the grease tube will need to be cut and then the needle can be inserted and the grease extracted. The grease is thick, which makes this challenging. If you have a less viscous lubricant on hand, that might be a better option. There is a small hole on the side of the bearing blocks that you can use to inject the grease. You should be able to access it pretty easily on the x-axis, but the other rails may prove difficult. In that case, you can apply the grease directly to the rail instead. All right, now we're officially ready to plug this in and turn it on. In the next video, I'll go over the software setup and initial calibrations. Thanks for watching. I hope this video was helpful for you. If you want to support my work, please consider joining me on Patreon. Not only will you be supporting the production of these videos, you'll also gain access to exclusive content and a catalog of high quality 3D printable models. As always, my name's Taylor, this is YGK3D, 
happy 3D printing.